Please join us in welcoming CEO of Uber, Dara Khosrowshahi, in conversation with Skift founder and CEO, Rafat Ali. Here for the best session of the day, Dara no has promised. No pressure. Uh, Dara has promised, and um, at this point, like Uber is a verb, Dara is a verb, right? In the in the in I the, was not in aware. the industry, that was not aware. Okay. Yeah. In in our world, All right. Dara is a verb. So, um, can we play this video? We the 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 first video is a setup. TripAdvisor instant booking. You were, you've been shut out. Where's a softball question here, Dennis? Come on. <laughs> so, uh, so the context for that question when you were at Expedia, and Dennis, who you know very well, yes. obviously, um, was just like coming at you from left and right and left and right for all types of questions. That's, and why, that's why you're interviewing me and Dennis isn't. Dennis isn't. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm kidding. So let me start with a softball. This is, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote. Uber has, this is the Financial Times, Uber has proven that it can stop the bleeding, but it has $33 billion of accumulated deficit on the balance sheet. It has not yet proven that it is a high return on investment business, a high return on capital business. So that's my softball. Thank you. And you want me to respond to that? Yes. Uh, so I think the Financial Times is right, right? Uh, we have, uh, since I joined the company six years ago, the company was burning, call it, uh, three or four billion dollars in cash flow a year. Uh, we were a verb, we are a verb, uh, and so it was a very large asset, incredible company, incredibly innovative, but we have had to adjust to the realities of life, which is at some point you have to turn from that burn and growth at any costs to profitable growth. And I think in certainly our industry, uh, and by any metric, we have been a leader in the field, right? So in the last quarter, we did over 2.3 billion transactions uh, just in the quarter, uh, over $30 billion in bookings, growing at 18% on a constant currency basis, so very, very strong growth rates. But more importantly, we had $1.1 billion in free cash flow, uh, and we were profitable for the first time, first time. Uh, for the company. So that was a first time, but now it's up to us, and, and I think we absolutely have the right path to consistently be profitable, consistently be kind of that profitable compounder and grower, the kind of company that can continue to innovate, that can grow in the high teens and 20s, but then can throw off cash the way that our investors certainly expect us to. So we, we got more to prove, but I'm certainly happy about where we are now versus where we were six where years we were ago. six years ago. So in terms of where the profitability will come from, um, is it take rate? Is it going into other parts of the business, uh, other parts of different parts of, of the ecosystem, et cetera? Where do you think that profitability will come from? So it, it, it really is going to come from scale, right? So the, uh, if I do my job correctly, and for us, take rate with uh, our revenue has a bunch of merchant agency uh, in it. So the, the revenue has a bunch of accounting kind of adjustments. But if I'm doing my job, we grow the company at the same take rate that we are today uh, or lower over a period of time, which is essentially as lower. we scale, we should actually give some of that back to our partners. Uh, and we don't want to be guilty of, you know, there's a Bill Gurley uh, uh, blog of a take rate too far, yes. right? The, to the extent that your take rate is too high, that invites competition. But it's also not the right thing to do for our earners, right? We've got over six million earners now on our platform. Uh, the average driver. Six million earners, you're saying drivers. Drivers and our couriers on our platform right. who are engaged on, on our platform uh, and who are earning money on our platform. Uh, and so we certainly don't want to be taking away take rate from them, so to speak. So the growth is really going to come from scaling the business. Right? If you're running at a $2 billion transactional growth rate, growing at 20% a year with essentially a fixed cost base, the incremental profitability from that growth is going to come to the bottom line. That's the formula that got us here. 
and that's certainly the formula going forward. We're not dependent on take rate, but the business is growing really fast at big scale, and that's what it's going to be about. Keep growing and keep costs the same. The, the sort of go-get paradigm that you have come up with, so explain to people who don't know what the go-get paradigm that you come with and why is that important for you? Yeah, absolutely. So when I started at, uh, at Uber, we were essentially a, a transportation company, right? Uber was known for push a button, get a ride, go, uh, go anywhere. Uh, and about 90% of the business was transportation and, and Uber Eats was an incredible experiment that a couple of great, great uh, innovators within our company had set up and kind of came upon this experiment. Uh, and we started scaling Uber Eats. When the this pandemic- was a COVID, COVID thing, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. They, you know, then the pandemic, and, and Uber Eats was a very, very promising initiative for the company. Then the pandemic, you know, hits us like a ton of bricks. Uh, and the mobility business comes down by 85%. This is during a time where we were already losing billions of dollars, so like more losses, so th this was not a fun time. But the mitigating factor, and it was a very big mitigating factor, is that the delivery business absolutely exploded in a great way. Um, and it also allowed us to keep a number of our partners, of our drivers, working right. and earning. And instead of driving people, they started delivering food. Uh, now that we are out of the pandemic, about 50% of the business is mobility and about 50% of the business is delivery. So it's an extraordinary tra uh, transformation. transformation of the company. And what we're seeing is that our audience, we have about 137 million consumers who come to our platform every single month. We're kind of building this operating system for daily life for them. Yeah, which I saw is you use that phrase. Any, you know, anywhere you want to go, anything you want to get, we're going to be there for you. It translates into pretty incredible loyalty. So our average customer is using us five and a half times per month, right? So the number of touch points that we have with them is pretty extraordinary. And then on top of that, we've introduced a membership program. Yeah, Uber One. Where Uber One, uh, Which, by hopefully the way, all of your are, are members. Your um, team was very smart to advertise on the New York subway, which is kind of a slap in the face of subway, but let's continue. We love the subway too. We have subways on Uber as well. But it, for, for $9.99 a month, essentially no delivery fee, and then you get cash back on, on your rides as well. So there's a very strong lock-in now that we have with our customers making your day a little bit easier, saving you time, taking you anywhere, and get, 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 getting anything. And really, the anything now is expanded from food to grocery to pet food to liquor. We essentially want to empower the local merchant to out Amazon Amazon uh, by delivering not next day, but delivering next hour. That's really what we're so about. So do you think that there's awareness from a consumer perspective about the breadth beyond, say, Uber Eats, that, uh, just the restaurants you have today? No, uh, but our, you know, over a period of time, uh, we can work on that from a product front. The, the fact is when you've got, you know, 130 plus million consumers coming to your front door every, sing, every single month, uh, we essentially now have personalized AI algorithms yeah. that are looking at you, looking at your occasion, and determining what to put in front of you based on a personalized basis. So in the morning, we'll know you're going to work. So you have a work address right there, get your ride. But we might offer you, for example, a cup of coffee at Starbucks uh, on the way. And when you come home at night, then we'll upsell you to Uber Eats, et cetera. So it's a pretty extraordinary uh, selection of services that we have. And over a period of time, what we're seeing is that consumers are getting more and more locked into the ecosystem where we know you, we've got your payments detail, we know where you are, we know where you go, et cetera. We can give you those targeted offers more and more. And then on top of that, we've got an advertising business that can. Which I just get, uh, yeah. got uh, hit by, I think it was IHG's hotels ad. And, and so for those of you, if you've seen the ad, once you, once you um, explain how the ads come up. Yeah, so we, we've got a ad business now. It's about 650 million and growing. Uh, that came and out of nowhere. It's, it's uh, we go fast at Uber, right? Uh, and most of the ad business at this point is restaurant tours, uh, getting more exposure in okay. front of the Uber East customer. But more and more on our mobility app, you know, the Uber demographic is a very attractive demographic. It's a young demographic, about uh, over 50% of our consumers are 18 to 34. 
uh, mostly parents, over 50% of our consumers are parents, 50% uh, more likely to make 150,000 or more, so it's a, it's a relatively well-off consumer base as well. And again, we can target specific messages. So for example, when you're waiting for your Uber, yeah. Uh, we allow certain brands like Apple or IHG or Marriott or you know a lot of movie companies advertise with us Very to to get in front of you and advertise their brand as well. So uh, w you have described, but we haven't used the word super app. Not yet. What's where is your ambition on the super app front? Well, I mean the you know the super app um, word is a loaded term. Right, so we, we want to be that operating system because it's, it's not that like we're doing it for great business, it's we want to be that everyday use case for consumers and we want to surprise and delight them and make their life a little bit easier. You can call it a super app if you want, you can call it George if you want, um, but our ambition is to be that go-get app and to be that you know, everyday app that you go to. Uh, you recently launched, speaking of, uh, we were chatting about families back backstage, and you launched a, a, Uber, a teens. Uber Teens. So explain, yeah. this sounds dangerous. Uh, well, without Uber Teens, it's dangerous, right? So um, when I started at Uber, we, uh, you had to essentially be 18 or older to take an Uber. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, safety, et cetera. What we saw, what our drivers told us, is that there are many circumstances in which teenagers were taking an Uber. Uh, and not only did it go against the terms and conditions, but it made our driver partners feel pretty uncomfortable. Uh, but it was happening, right? And, and, it, and it's very difficult. They were using their parents' account, et cetera. Uh, so we decided to um, really focus on building a product that would make me as a parent, you know, I've got a teen, feel safe enough putting my teen in, in an Uber. And we have been very, very focused on safety as being absolutely prominent in terms of our own initiatives. Standing for safety is a, is a cultural value of the company. Uh, and so when you build this Uber Teens account, first of all, the parent has account and can invite their teen to uh, sign on to Uber. We restrict the pool of drivers to only the best drivers in a particular market who have, who have a lot of history, et cetera. Right. Um, the parent can track the teen automatically when there's a pickup, when there's a drop off. Uh, we have a pin so that it's not just, you know, Uber for Rafa. It's, there's a pin number that you have to give to your driver yes. and the driver gives to you as well. So there's zero confusion in terms of the And there was the, the live handoff. audio recording? Yeah, and then there's live audio recording so that we are recording the ride in case something happens. And actually you as a parent can call the driver directly just to make sure that your teen is okay. So we have really embedded a set of features for teens that we think is absolutely best of breed. It is a delightful, like I've gotten a ton of comments from friends who've used this product. It's a delightful product and, you know, listen, the safest thing you can do is stay home. But the fact is, especially in our world here, we're going out, et cetera, and I don't think there's any safer way, other than you're driving your teen yourself, yeah. your teen getting around in the city, because you can see exactly where they're going, when they're going, when they get there, et cetera. It's a, it's a pretty extraordinary product that we built. Uh, in terms of, uh, by the way, we will have time for questions, so if you want to send questions, please uh, do through the app, and I'm going to try and get to um, as many as we can. Um, Uber Boats. Uber Freight, I think in India, is, it, is that correct? Uh, Uber Freight in the U.S. actually. In the U.S. In, in India we have Tuk Tuk's, three wheelers. Uh, yeah, in three -wheelers. Brazil we have two wheelers, Uber Moto, et cetera. Lots of Ubers going around. So um, uh, let's step back for your original love, which is travel. Yes. Still on the Expedia board. I am. Um, Expedia, uh, but you chose Hopper for yes. your Uber flights. Yes. Expedia and Hopper are having a fight. They are. They just had a divorce. Uh, both of them spoke on, on this yes. uh, stage about that. Um, as a board member, you're conflicted. Uh, yeah, so have... being uh, plain spoken as a board member, I am conflicted, so I had nothing to do with that decision. Okay. Um, so I can't tell you if it's right or wrong. Okay, Dennis, that's your answer. Dennis, ask <laughs> me to make sure I ask this question. Uh, please say something more if you have, if, if it's more controversial. No, it, it, listen, it's, it's too close to home. So, of course, I would have picked Expedia, but these are, I'm the, I'm the CEO of Uber, so I've got to leave it up to the team, and the team made a determination. 
that they wanted to pick Hopper, and that's their determination. Um, in terms of how much Uber can lean into travel, Uber boats, I guess, is yes. one, Uber flights is another. You've experimented, I think, uh, in India with air. I forget, maybe you did, I forget. Well, most of our experimentation in travel has been in the UK, actually. In the UK. Yeah. yeah. Um, why that market? Well, um, the UK is one of the top markets that we have in the world. Right. Uh, and when you look at travel, it's actually a very, very interesting target market for us. So uh, the average Uber uh, customers so of, of the you know, 2.3 billion trips every single quarter that customers are, are, taking, are taking on Uber, every quarter about 6 to 8% of those trips are international trips. So to you using Uber in, in France, country, for example. Correct. Uh, in every quarter, about 22 to 24% of trips that are being taken, or 22 to 24% of our, uh, our Uber users, are traveling someplace outside of their home market. Right. So when you add that all up, last year we had about 700 million trips happening on Uber outside of your home market. So these are Uber travelers. users who are traveling, who yeah. are travelers. So we know that the audience is a very large audience, uh, very big travel audience, and we decided, hey, let's put actually travel product in front of, because people are traveling on Uber today. Uh, and we decide, let's take a leading market like the UK, and let's actually build in travel functionality to Uber, and what we're seeing is actually very encouraging results. So for example, uh, consumers in the UK who have booked uh, coach or train on Uber, 60% of them are already repeating. Flight users, about 30% of them are already repeating as well. So we have this giant travel audience, uh, and for us to actually start to market travel product to them through partners at this point uh, is, we think, a great, great opportunity. And early on, our travelers in the UK love the product. So when I thought I got a question. Oh, well, Dennis is going to ask. Oh, no, Jason, you again? Yeah, me. Uh, Jason wa wanted to ask this question, but he was too chicken to come out. Just kidding, Jason. Um, <laughs> So 50% of your revenue is rides, 50% of your revenue is mobility, 0% is travel. Um, when you got into travel, everybody was saying, uh-oh, watch out, here's another Expedia in the making. But if I have a problem with my flight, it's canceled, I can't get the right seat, do I really want to go through Uber for customer service for flights? Well, I think if, as we build out those experiences, we will build a full-fledged experience. So if we can't delight you in terms of your flight experience on Uber, we're not going to build it, right? And, and we're very early on the journey, but when you have 700 million people traveling on your platform and an audience that's as loyal to us, and again, we've got your information, we've got your payments information, your, we can stitch together your movement to, from, hotel. Our Uber Reserve product is one of our top products as well. We think we can build a delightful end-to-end -end experience. And if we can't build that delightful end-to-end -end experience, we're gonna stay out of it. Have you become more product person since you joined Uber? Yes. Uh, the amount of innovation happening at Uber, I, I think the, the biggest delta... Because you were a you know, deal say, guy. What's that? You were a deal guy. Yeah, but I get to change. No, meaning, I mean, I'm just giving the, the, people yeah. uh, the, the history. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, originally I came as a deal guy and uh, I'd say the biggest difference between Uber and, let's say, Expedia was that the OTAs are very dependent on traffic, and especially external traffic, and, let's say, Google traffic as well. So a significant amount of energy was spent on how do we acquire customers, how do we retain customers, et cetera. Uber has the Uber audience, the 130 million plus. This is the audience that comes direct. This is the audience that comes often. So Are you just much happy more, not to spend so much money on Google? Well, listen, it's, and then it's all about the product, right? So like you've got to build delightful uh, products for the customer. And if you look over the past six years, we built out, you know, we've scaled out Uber Eats. We built out a grocery product from scratch. We now have built a direct product where essentially we've taken our fulfillment back in to empower every single merchant uh, to, to ship next hour anything that they want to the customer. We built out Uber Reserve, we built out Uber Teens. Uh, we now, you can get New York City cabs on Uber as well. We yes. built Uber Taxi. So the amount of innovation coming out of Uber and the focus on product 
is different and it's much higher and it's something that I love. Do you speak to Brian Chesky? Yes. What advice would you have from him, for him? For him, okay. On the regulation challenges that he's having. Have you overcome the regulation challenges? By and large, so I, uh, you know, I don't know if you can say we've overcome the regulation challenges. I, I think, like e even those words to me are wrong, okay. right? Which is, we play a really important role in people's lives and earners' lives, and that means that regulators are a constituency and a very important constituency. That you're not looking to overcome, right? Like you're, you want to build product that fits within the regula regulatory framework. And regulators, typically, they're trying, to, they're trying to do good things, right? So for us, for example, with our earners, when I started Uber, we had independent contractors. It's all about flexibility, et cetera. We have now, with many regulators in dialogue, built out a product, for example, in the UK, that has minimum earning standard, that has you know, vacation pay, pension pay, et cetera. And that's a win for regulators, because it's important for that country, that standard. And it's a win for us because it makes Uber more attractive uh, as a place to you know, get flexible work at. So I think that I've absolutely learned that with regulators, it's about understanding what it is that they're after. It's making sure that they understand your point of view and then looking to co-create a solution that works for everybody. It's not, you know, so no, we're not overcoming reg regulation. We're gonna work with regulators like for the rest of time, because they're a very, very important voice in what we build. Has the battle of gig workers, not employees, employees, somewhere in the middle, has that, is that battle over? Um, it, it's not over, but I do think that more and more of regulators, anyone around the world is realizing that the First, they recognize that 80% of our drivers don't want to be employees, right? If you want to be, if you want to be employed, lots of jobs available in, in here, in many places around the world. Our drivers want the flexibility to be able to earn on their own terms, their small businesses in and of themselves. Marrying that with protections like minimum, late, uh, minimum earnings just makes sense. So I do think that answer is proving out to be the better answer. It's taken some time, and I think more and more of the countries in which we operate recognize that as the, as the better way forward. Flexibility plus protections makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's shift gears for a second. Um, I asked you in 2017 when you were Expedia CEO on what keeps you up at night and what, what are you worried about? These were the early days. What would disrupt Expedia? That was my question. These are the early days of Alexa. Alexa had just launched. And you gave an answer which in, in I guess, six, seven years from, now, from, from then to now is prescient in AI um, perspective, which is you said, if the interface of search changes, yeah. and this was the days of voice search, obviously that didn't work. It's back again on the AI on the is definitely back, yeah. So um, one, how do you think, obviously you use a lot of AI that even before generative AI became a thing, and so how are you thinking about AI and will the interface of Uber change? So it, generally, you know, Uber has been an AI-powered company for years and years right. and years, right? So when you're routing, your estimated time of arrival, whether we batch your, uh, your delivery, pricing, all of it is based on AI algorithms. And, and by the way, there's strength and weaknesses to that, right? It, sometimes it makes the system outputs less predictable, so you need better technology to be able to audit those system outputs. So AI isn't like the perfect solve everywhere. Right. Um, as it relates to generative AI and kind of this new generation of AI, there's, I think the number one, and it's kind of boring, but, but it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity, is actually productivity, right? So building out um, uh, gen AI co-pilots for our devs, uh, building out gen uh, AI co-pilots for our customer service agents, Mm -hmm. to make sure that if something goes wrong, we're there for you. Uh, building out a co-pilot for our drivers and earners. How do I earn, where do I go, what do I do, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that as far as having Gen AI kind of building an agent interface, mm -hmm. uh, I think that that is certainly has potential. But if I were to rate, you know, if you have 100 
opportunity set, you know, that's probably 10 of the 100. Mm -hmm. And there's 90 opportunity set as far as how you build out these systems, how you percolate knowledge, and then how do you, how, how much productivity can you get from your employees, and then especially customer service. And for us, this earner co-pilot is a very, very big deal. Okay, let's get to uh, some questions, and, and, and then I do have a closing question, but let's go. Seth, uh, I'm guessing this is our Seth Porco. Uh, I'll admit I switched to Lyft because of Chase Perks. How important are the credit cards to your strategy? Is Rideshare the new airline in terms of credit card rewards? Um, well, Seth, thank you for the question. Uber One is better than Chase Perks, and um, you should get a platinum card. So, uh, you know, listen, I, I think that our relationship with credit cards, with airlines, is very important. Um, I wouldn't call it the thing, but it certainly is an element that can get consumers to change. Um, you know, Lyft is a good competitor, but I think we're doing just fine. Any plans to bring back the loyalty program for frequent riders buyers? Is, isn't that, I mean, I guess it's a that, That's product. Uber One. So, so we had a loyalty program, and we decremented that loyalty program to bring in Uber One. Uh, you have to pay nine ninety nine for it. Our average consumer transacts with us five times a month. Typically, after two transactions or three transactions, Uber One becomes profitable. So we just thought it was a better product for consumers, especially because we have so much frequency on the platform. Okay. Um, how do you justify, oh, this is a question that has been there from, from day one for, for Uber, and particularly in New York. In, in, uh, insane surge prices, especially for New Yorkers, I've seen Uber prices $1.50 for two miles for travel, even during peak pandemic. Yeah, um, I can't say I can justify those prices. I think the marketplace, Uber will surge to those kinds of prices when there's an enormous shortage of drivers. And the way to get a driver for you is to surge. Uh, and by the way, drivers are getting a significant portion of the dollar kind of pool that comes from surge. Uh, so I think post-pandemic, unfortunately, we had much more demand than we had uh, drivers on the platform. The good news is we have many more drivers on the platform. Their engagement on the platform is increasing. And surge generally in every single market, including uh, New York, is coming down. So hopefully you won't see those prices uh, too often now in New York. What, was your, what did the experience of you becoming a driver teach you? Uh, it taught me that it's, one, it's hard to be a driver. There's a lot that you have to deal with in terms of taking care of your rider, making sure that you're driving safely, and understanding kind of, you know, getting your next ride, understanding where to go, et cetera. I think the second for us was that drivers spend a lot more time on the app. So how you build the Uber app for drivers is different than for consumers, which is, with consumers essentially, you want to build the shortest interaction for the consumer. Get into the Uber app, get what you want, and then you know, finish. Right. With drivers, our drivers are on the app for four, five, six hours a day. So the quality bar, making sure that the fit and finish of the app is absolutely excellent, uh, and being able to personalize the app for every use case. Do you like short trips? Do you like airport trips, et cetera? That quality bar has to go up in terms of how you build for your earners. Okay. Um, will you be selling travel products in the OTA? Uh, yes. Do you think, yeah, I guess you, we are. You already we started. are very excited about travel. Do you think you've solved the connected trip faster than booking, given the challenge of last mile mobility? You know, Glenn has been talking about connected trip forever, but I guess. Uh, Jair's question is, do you think you've solved the connected trip faster than booking given the challenge of last mile mobility? You, you know, I think that um, I, I haven't seen exactly what booking has done, so I okay. don't want to com compare us to booking. Uh, I say we're very early in the travel path, right? We've only been at it for about a year and a half. The signal that we see from travel is awesome. Our customers seem to love the integration of travel uh, into Uber, and certainly with 700 million rides happening outside of your home city, uh, we've got the audience, but uh, I wouldn't put ourselves up against Booking.com because, frankly, at this point, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I use Expedia for my travel, so. Yes, exactly. A um, couple of questions. Uh, the, is the driverless car dream over? No. The driverless car dream I know dream your is, investments are gone. Well, so we have, you know, you got to focus on what you're great at. And what we are really great at is 
building out essentially this network of GoGet um, and the largest network. You got 130 million users connecting with 6 million earners and connecting them every single day in a delightful way. That's what we focus on. Um, we, the building out autonomous vehicles is something that great companies like uh, Waymo and Cruise and Aurora are working on. And we would much rather partner with industry rather than try to build those solutions ourselves. So we are actively bringing autonomous content onto Uber. Today, when you order Uber Eats in Los Angeles, you might get that delivery uh, delivered by a little serve uh, sidewalk robot. Hmm. Um, and in Las Vegas, when you take an Uber, we might uh, get uh, a robot to take you from point A to B uh, in Vegas today. So it's absolutely a dream on Uber that we're working on. Ten years? Ten years, it'll be a, a small but decent part of our business. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, EVs, obviously, you've, you've made a big commitment on EVs. Yes. And, and a lot of people in all parts of the world will get introduced to, this is the pitch that I'm sure the car makers are giving you in terms of adoption. Yeah. It's like they will get, get introduced to EV as a result of using Uber. Yeah, so we've got about 85,000 now EVs on Uber. We're the largest network of on-demand EVs in the world. It's a billion dollar business for us now. Uh, in California today, 10% of your trips are now EVs. And the great news is that the earners, the drivers who use EVs and the customers who take EVs, it's an absolutely delightful experience. The problem with EVs right now is twofold, which is EVs largely other than Tesla are a luxury product, mm -hmm. you know, 50, 60, $80,000 that doesn't work for a driver pool. Right. Uh, and the charging infrastructure in cities and then in the neighborhoods where our drivers live is not yet robust enough. So we need big time investment in chargers in the right places, and we need more cars that are uh, affordable for our drivers. So we've got partnerships, for example, with uh, Hertz, right. who's bringing um, not just Teslas, but other electric vehicles onto the platform, or we have direct relationships with Ford that is you know, making Mach-E's available to our drivers as well. That affordability gap is something that everybody needs to work on, including ourselves. Okay. So um, I want you to play this last video, and I have a question following that. And, um... uh oh. You know, you look at Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, Jamie Dimon, uh, you know, Jack Welch. Greatness takes time. It takes time to build your craft. People talk about financially comp the magic of compounding. There's a career compounding that's magic. Yeah. Uh, and I think if, you, if you're a three years or four years and out kind of a person, you're really missing out on that career compounding. It does take time, but when you take advantage of that, magic happens then. So, uh, so this was an interview, Dara, you gave maybe last year to the CEO of LinkedIn. This is the, his, his series. And at the end of this 10-minute interview, he said, give three advice on the career. And I don't know what you were thinking, if it was a throwaway advice or not, but it affected me a lot because the word career compounding was a word that sort of touched on, sort of a, put a pulse on something that I've been thinking through as an entrepreneur, as a, as a person who, who hires people, wants them to do well in life over a period of time, wants them to fly out of the coop mm -hmm. and have wings after that. Um, explain what you mean by that. Hey, listen, the, the first thing, and I talked about it here, is that just it, it takes time to do great things, right? I've been at Uber for six years, and a couple of folks are like, so what are you looking for next? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm staying. Like, I love this, and I'm not even nearly done. You know, how long have you run Skip now? 11 right? years now. Yeah, 11 years. So it just, the, I see young people who are too impatient. I see young people who are making career plans not based on what they're going to do or whom they're going to work for, but based on you know, what their uh, title is going to be or how much are they going to get paid. And when you have targets like that, like my, I never planned. I used to be a banker. I never planned to go work for Barry Diller. And yes, I was a deal person. I never planned to go to Expedia. I never planned to go to Uber. But I was open-minded. And I've always been much more focused on what is it that I'm going to do? Is it interesting? Is it impactful? Um, who is it that I'm going to work with? Can I learn from this person? Because another part of career compounding is 
not only do you get the benefit of your own work, but you get the benefit of learning from your team. And if you have a successful team, they're going to kind of move you yeah. up as well, lift you up as well. And then lastly, is the place that I'm going to go to or the people uh, that uh, I'm working with, do they want to have impact, right? Am I having impact in an impactful place? If the answer of those three things, which is, is what I'm doing interesting, are the people that I work with interesting, someone I can learn from, and is that work that we're all coming together impactful, then you've got me for life. Uh, that is you know, what's always guided me. Uh, and I do think that the best opportunities often are the opportunities that surprise you. Mm -hmm. So just don't be too linear. You know, people always look for signals that agree with their assumptions. Uh, and it's sometimes those unexpected signals that move you off into another corner that do the best things for you. Like I never ever expected Uber to you know, be an opportunity for me, but it's been six amazing years, really hard years uh, for me of development. Uh, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. And if I had a very specific view of what I wanted to do by X time, I would have missed it. That would be a crime. Okay, all right. With that, Dara, we're out of time. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank Appreciate you. It.